skilling session of the Mums in Tech series, Mums Returning to Tech series uh, with the Reactor in Sydney slash everyone joining us from across Australia. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've got, I'll just run through our normal ones. I'm Renee. I'm a cloud advocate for Microsoft. And I do a lot of work with the Reactor. We've also has, have Nadia who you can contact with the contact details that I'll provide in a second. She runs the admin -y, and event organization side of the reactor. A uh, reminder of our code of conduct, always be kind and respectful and welcoming. Uh, and you know, asking, you know, be curious and ask questions, um, but be friendly and patient when looking for answers. Uh, as I said, we're recording this session. Uh, we'll make the session available after the series. And yeah, hopefully you can enjoy it then. Hopefully if you're watching this, you're enjoying it now. Uh, and here are some of the links. You'll have seen these many times before, hopefully, uh, with our pre-work Cloud Skills Challenge and then our coursework Cloud Skills Challenge and, yeah, all the other session details. So we'll have one more session after this, which is the just the casual catch-up, which will be in two weeks. And there are the, is the email address if you need to get in contact with us or the LinkedIn group. Uh, so... Here we go. Uh, in today's session, we've got a double feature. Uh, we've called the session Bringing a Project and Your Career to Life, How Modern Teams Use Agile Methodology, and also, it's flowed off the uh, slide actually, how to, pre you know, how to present yourself best on LinkedIn to kickstart your career. So in this, we're going to learn about common practices you'll encounter in tech careers uh, with agile development in companies uh, to make technology iteratively better to drive results to customers faster and get some tips on how to best show off your new skill set that you got through this course uh, and approach the job market. So we've got Ariane and Michelle here today. I've just got some buys for them as well. Uh, so Ariane is, a, is an app dev cloud solution architect at Microsoft. He does all things Azure, modern web development methodologies and open source frameworks. He uh, he also transforms customer businesses and mindsets and tool chains to work with the new fastest in the fast paced world of cloud. Uh, we've also got Michelle, who's a Microsoft developer engagement lead for emerging developers, including students, return to work professionals, career changers, data scientists, game devs. So she's really there for everyone. Uh, she is a TEDx speaker, Australian Computer, Science, Computer Society WA, WA chairman, retired, but, you know, still at heart, and a Microsoft D, uh, and one of MCV's 30 most influential women in games. So two very awesome speakers here today. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Arian first. She's going to be talking about Agile. So I'll just stop sharing my screen so you can have it for all your Agile needs. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, that's all come up. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right. Um, yes, it's 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 a bit of a topic, really, just to kind of re re um, revisit, I guess, what's what's agile and how it all kind of fits in again um, with the latest generation of um, cloud movements and tech. Um, so really, uh, you know, before we had agile. Um, some of these processes date back to early sort of car manufacturing processes, particularly in Japan, um, which which is basically Toyota. They looked at streamlining different processes, improving quality, increasing the output, all the usual things, right, that companies want. So they've actually started on this little uh, particular approach back in the 1950s. And essentially back in 1990s with the whole IT um, explosion, a lot of these thought leaders that came up with lots of different project methodologies. And back then, a lot of the methodologies were still pretty much stuck in kind of your typical engineering mindsets where you have like a waterfall approach. You have to finish the first phase before you get to the next phase because it gave them a false sense of control and I guess predictability. Um, but in, in actual, you know, real life stuff, apart from building buildings, which is a pretty well known sort of process. IT and and quite a few things actually that we deal with for life is actually quite unpredictable, right? So with that, um, around 2001, a lot of these individuals basically caught up together, um, I don't know, somewhere in Colorado, I think in the US, and they came up with this concept um, and they actually coined this thing called the Agile uh, Software Manifesto. So originally focused towards software development, 
But what has since happened is Agile is no longer just applicable to software developers and, and IT um, companies. Given that here we're talking about moms returning back to tech, I think, yes, we will definitely talk a little bit more on, from the tech side of things. But if you look at like the four um, sort of values that they have here, um, they can be, I guess, spread across any of the industries or verticals, right? So yeah, it's really, you know, it's hard to believe like this, this, this is now what, 22 um, years ago that this happened. Um, and, you know, back then it was pretty out of the ordinary, right? To see, you know, these type of practices. It was usually the, the startups that kind of went into, you know, co-location, um, you know, whiteboards and, 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 and sticky, sticky notes all over the place. Um, and now it's yeah, become basically a, a scalable framework that a lot of companies use. Now, if you look on the right, these are actually some of the, the principles uh, that Agile stands for. So frequent delivery, changing requirements, because these are all normal facts of life, right? Um, trust and empowerment, another one that kind of goes co completely against the whole waterfall uh, approach, right? And one of the key ones I tend to kind of um, technical excellence, I think that's something you can kind of pick up. But one of the things that's really um, quite quite important are these two things, right? The self-organizing teams, um, which which is really, you know, managing complexity of this technical product development requires like diversity of different sort of thoughts, right? So complex problems. Um, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna get like a big boss that's gonna give you all the answers. You're gonna need to come up with new way of thinking in short sprints. Um, and and I think from the diversity of different people, that's where you get the different thoughts, right? So Microsoft's kind of gone through similar changes internally as well. Um, when I was hired, I remember, I guess the HR manager gave us a presentation and said, you know, we only used to look for kind of very analytical people at the start. But now we're actually looking for people that can actually tick quite a few of the other boxes as well. Some really creative people that don't have to be super analytical and all that, because it does breed um, different ideas. And with that, I think you can definitely get um, better improvements. Now, speaking of um, continuous uh, improvement, um, that's also a really important part of Agile, rather than like with Waterfall, waiting until the whole project is completed and then only realizing, oh my God, we didn't really quite meet or you know, what was really expected from this. Um, after every sprint um, inside Agile, now Agile is really just a, I guess, an approach. Um, and a lot of people go, what are the rules of Agile? These are, this is why we always list the four values and the 12 principles, but there are many different frameworks um, that kind of take the Agile approach and then make it unique. So the Toyota approach, for example, was the Kanban approach which is all about like a, uh, a free flowing river. They want to optimize that output um, versus Scrum, which is uh, again around um, self-organizing teams and then shorter sprints and then feedback loops to make sure, um, you know, that what they're delivering is actually uh, aligning up with, with the expectations. So with that, um, why, you know, why are we still talking about Agile? It's been around for such a long time. I think now it's even more important to understand Agile than ever before, because I think previously kind of Agile was like, yeah, it's a software development sort of approach. People kind of mostly in IT kind of took it seriously, but outside of IT, it was like, yeah, it's some geeky sort of thing. It's yet another project management thing. Um, but I think especially now with the fast, faster paced uh, world and with the fact that, you know, most of us are, you know, working in remote scenarios, um, and we do need that um, adaptability, right? Um, the future is more ambiguous. Um, the complexity of the context, the conditions and the work, everything is different, right? And it's increased. So I guess the agile approach prioritizes the responsiveness to these changing conditions and moves away from processes which slow things down and get in the way of, the, of, of this progress, right? So it really helps, I guess, companies shift quickly and I think this is, you know, again, important. We've all seen what happened during COVID. The companies that did survive and thrive were the ones that actually could pivot pretty quickly, um, not just on the business model, but also to change, you know, their supply chains and whatnot, everything else to do. change to the needs of the customers, right? Um, and then the next one, I guess, is the speed and results. Um, so, you know, work is definitely, I, I, I can say for myself, it's becoming more and more intense. 
the customer demand and expectation is definitely just higher and higher. And there's almost this like expectation of perfection um, wherever you go, right? The quality bar just keeps uh, raising. So companies really must run faster to keep up with their competition as well. And they can't afford to have any sort of missteps, um, you know, because that can have amplifying effects on the social side of things um, and, and in the media, right? The next one is engagement, right? So because Agile values people and their experience, it puts the people ahead of the process. Um, whereas, you know, previously it was all about contract negotiations and making sure, you know, lawyers were basically involved to make sure that there's, if anything goes wrong, we're kind of protected. Um, this is different, right? We, we, we're really going to value what people bring to the table. Um, and this is kind of what people's expectations are as well, right? If they're going to be going to work and if they're going to be working, you know, for so many hours during the day, they want to feel appreciated um, um, by these companies and the projects that they work on. So, you know, they expect, you know, better conditions uh, for well-being, belonging and meaning. Um, and an Agile makes that difference here as well, right? So when, when companies uh, uh, adopt Agile, the alignment between groups and businesses is a bit tighter, right? And there is a sense of line of sight from work. You do feel accountable and responsible for things. And based on that, I think you do put in the better effort and as a result, better outcomes come out of it, right? Um, and, you know, this is this is important because now that, you know, a lot of us are still working from home, you still need to have that sense of team and engagement and empowerment. Um, so yeah, I think this is a, another key one. And then, uh, you know, we talk, talked about it before, responding to the change um, or we're following some sort of hard uh, line plan. Yeah, definitely an important note. So what to expect, right? Um, so in this way of working, um, we have this concept of sprints, essentially just short term you know, sort of goals that you set and you try and achieve um, within that period. Now, it's not about, you know, yes, we want to make, you know, we want to strive to achieve them. But if we don't achieve them, it's not like a penalty, right? Because we might have actually hit some genuine things that we didn't really expect, or we might have uncovered some more things during that sprint, which, yeah, it looks like, okay, now we have another sprint to try and complete what we didn't complete in the previous sprint. Or maybe we've actually parked or, um, uh, demystified maybe some of the requirements in a, in a greater detail, which would actually lead to a better outcome, right? Um, it also requires a lot more sort of involvement from the business. Um, we'll get into kind of the personas and the users um, that, that are part of, I guess, the Scrum methodology. But a large part here is there's a lot more involvement um, with the end user that's going to get this product um, um, in their hands. And we want to make sure that they're pleased, right, at every stage of the cycle. Um, as I said earlier, functionality is built um, iteratively. Um, um, and, you know, these sprints and releases, we make sure they're time boxed, right? So we don't go endlessly um, in, in these directions. We can pivot pretty fast. So um, very quickly, high level roles. So there's kind of like four or five high level roles. Some companies will have more, some will have at least these four roles. Generally, we have a scrum master. This is like the person really responsible for gluing everything together, right? Ensuring the scrum is being done properly, um, making sure, you know, teams are getting along um, and making sure, I guess, um, the product owner, that's the next role, define the value, the development team deliver the value, and the Scrum team get it all done together, right? Um, this type of person generally is not your, you know, big boss that just shouts at you and, and forces things down your throat. It's more of a, a servant leader, um, which is really, it, it's more of a supportive style of leadership, right? Um, so adopting Agile, yes, definitely there's cultural things that need to change there. Um, and they serve really um, the product owner by helping them better understand and communicate value, um, managing that backlog to help them plan and work, like what are the next features that need to be built, like what's the most important thing. And then again, on the, on, on the development side, you know, serving the development team um, to self-organize, um, to make sure that they're working on the right things, and if there are issues there, to kind of help unblock there as well. Right. The next role is the product owner. So this is actually a really crucial role. Um, 
This person basically understands customer and business requirements and then creates a product backlog based on those requirements. So since you know these agile teams are by design flexible and responsive, it really is the responsibility of this product owner to ensure that they're delivering the most valuable you know, feature or bit of work. Um, the business is represented by the product owner who tells the development team, you know, what's the most important um, thing to deliver. And trust between these two roles is like really, really important, right? So your product owner is not your typical old um, style project manager. Um, another thing that they are also responsible for on top of, you know, aligning all these values is release management. Um, so these people will come and come up with plans around the release cycles, um, product planning, product roadmap, and will probably be one of those crucial uh, presenters back to the business unit as well on how everything's tracking. Okay, and now like what I think is, is the most important thing because I generally kind of sit in this space is the actual, you know, whether it's a development team or whether it's even a marketing team, right? Um, the same thing applies. They'll be delivering, you know, this team basically delivers the work throughout the whole sprint. Um, so they're really responsible for providing, I guess, transparency during the sprint, uh, meeting at these daily standups. Now, daily standups, although, you know, product owners kind of tend to join them, um, it's really up to the dev, um, you know, these teams and individuals to get together to have an honest, and truthful and meaningful conversation, right? With those daily standups. It's not about looking like a rock star and going, oh my God, you know, I've completed all these work items. No, it's actually to figure out like whether you genuinely need some help or whether something is unrealistic, um, you know, and we want to keep it nice and short. Um, and then the next role, of course, is our stakeholder. My slides have um, stopped. So these are really the people that you're building this stuff for. It could be internal businesses. It could be, you know, combination of internal and external. But essentially, you know, these, these are the people that are paying for a lot of this stuff. And you want to make sure that you're providing, um, you know, the value that they want to see out of those products there. Right. So now, now that we know that, let's have a quick look at the, um, the Scrum framework, right? So we talked about sprints. We mentioned what they are. Um, in this diagram, we say two weeks. Um, this can be decided inside a team. It might be a four week sprint, right? Um, but generally it's between two or four weeks. Um, most of the teams I work with are usually two weeks, right? You wanna be able to deliver something in that period, but you also wanna be able to kind of, within that period, um, walk away from it thinking, right, you know, we haven't blown way too much time and, and lost time there as well. So it supports pivoting. So what generally happens, I'll just open up these guys, is um, a product owner, as I said before, works closer to, you know, to the business and stakeholders. They come up with a prioritized wish list, right? And that goes into the product backlog. Now, during the sprint planning, so this includes basically everyone, um, including the feature team, uh, the team pulls together small chunks, right, of items from that wish list. Um, and that becomes, I guess, the sprint uh, backlog, right? Um, and describes, and every, you know, each of these teams, they can then go and estimate how much this stuff is going to take. So they can actually roughly say within two weeks, we, we're pretty confident that we might be able to deliver this. Now, um, usually, you know, it's two to four weeks, as I said before, and there's a daily sort of scrum or sometimes referred to as the daily standup where you know, people check in, escalate any issues that might be blocking them, et cetera, et cetera. So along the way, basically Scrum Master is, is across all those circles, right? Um, making sure everything's ticking along nicely. Now, um, at the end of the sprint, um, you're gonna have, a, uh, I guess, a sprint review. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, let's see what else is there. Sprint review, as well as a retrospective. Right, that comes up. And um, sprint reviews are essentially the team showing off, you know, what they've actually achieved in that sprint, right? What is the function that's been built? Usually they'll have a stakeholder as well as the product owner in those sessions. And then a retro is really just the retrospective, like what went right, what went potentially not so good, and how can we really improve on it, right? So that's that continuous sort of um, iteration loop. Now, in theory, yes. Agile kind of 
a lot of them kind of fit this process, right? It's all about that continuous innovation. And, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords out there um, that kind of talk about the same thing. DevOps is another process that kind of closely aligns to this continuous feedback loop as well. In terms of like the actual ceremonies that belong to Scrum, we talked about the sprint planning, we talked about the sprints review and retrospectives. Um, these are rough sort of um, time periods for a two week uh, period, at least, you know, around two hours is usually spent on sprint planning. Um, you know, there they define, you know, what will what will, will we look to deliver during the sprint and how we're going to do it, right? The next one is the sprint review. Um, as I said earlier, it's really about just showing, you know, what you've actually delivered, we're able to deliver, and any potential refinement that might need to go back into the into the backlog to improve maybe in the next sprint as well. Um, retros, um, usually these get pretty heated um, at the start, right? Because people are like, oh my God, this went wrong and this went wrong, and they find more negatives than positives. But over time, um, if you're actually improving, you'll start to see that there are actually it becomes a more balanced um, sort of review there as well. Um, now, moving on. So, you know, Scrum is, like I said, right, it forms the basic process for teams um, collaborating, planning and delivering, right? But it doesn't really speak to technical best practices, organizational standards or defining and driving like the agile culture. So we'll quickly look at kind of, this is from a tooling perspective, but generally customers align with some tools as well to support these practices. It's not just about people in process, there's also technology there as well. Um, I've got a screenshot here from Azure DevOps as an example sort of tool and how customers kind of break up. This is just the standard Agile template. Of course, a lot of our customers will go and, you know, customize this stuff to, to meet the business language that's there and potentially alignment to the various different roles that they might have that are, you know, not described here. But essentially, from a big picture, there's the portfolio backlog, which are these big epics, right? These are the dreams, you know, like I'm going to build the most amazing, you know, search engine and it's going to find everything valuable in there. So it's a really high level uh, goal. But then as you go lower in here, you actually start to become more and more defined around what that means um, and what the definition of done is, especially when you get into kind of the user story side of things. Um, generally, the, the teams working on delivery are, are basically working in this layer here from the backlog, the user stories, which have tasks, and then you might have, you know, bugs associated to those tasks as well, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, I know we mentioned the roles, but this is a little bit more detail around, you know, what does the product owner really do when it comes to this, this view, right? So they're usually the voice of the customer. Um, you know, they distill these ideas, their feedback, and the, um, they really create the product vision. So they'll be building, I guess, the epics and everything else with the business. Um, now, what they do then is the product owner still breaks down the product vision into a series of these user stories. And each of those user stories really should identify like the target users, the challenges, the why the solution is you know, required in this particular way and any constraints, right, as well as acceptance criteria or what we sometimes refer to as the definition of done. Um, a user story, generally, a good user story will will start with as a, and then, you know, whatever that user is, as an administrator or as, as a typical user or reader, what do you want to achieve? And then what's the benefit? You need to know the value, right? Because that becomes part of your calculation on what are gonna be the items that you pick up um, first. And then definition of done, this one is usually <laughs> a bit loose with companies. Um, and the whole point again here is Scrum Master should pick up when things are a little bit loosey-goosey and try and actually lift up the quality there, right? But essentially, you know, what does it mean that this user story is now completed, i.e. it's ready to actually ship, right? So it could be, you know, it needs to work functionally, non-functionally, you know, tests need to pass. But it could be a lot more than that, right? It could be that, you know, it's been proven through some telemetry that it's ready to be shipped as well. So those are all unique, I guess, to different customers. Um, feature team, we talked about it before, they, they perform the work, they could, you know, they are building these potentially shippable features and they're constantly adapting to change, right? Because they might have spent a whole sprint trying to figure out something 
didn't quite work. They have to bend um, everything around in the next sprint to come up with another approach. Um, Scrum Master really overlooking everything and coaching the team. Um, and really, once you once you have this um, singing quite well in, in seeing these teams, then you build these focus teams. So sometimes it takes a few sprints to get there because you need to build the trust as well between your team members. Sometimes people are brand new, right? You've never really worked with them before. But once you do build that trust um, iteratively, you should be kind of starting to see the payoff there, right? So generally um, timelines. So, you know, sprint zero is usually like a one or two week process. It's all about, you know, backlog preparation, prioritization um, and, and planning. And then your sprints, which you set the cadence for, they all end up kind of following the same style, right? Where, you know, you have your development of, of sprint elements, your daily stand ups could be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on the size of the team, but it should be quite short per person. Um, and then, you know, there should be a process to define, you know, the user stories during that sprint for the next sprint as well. So you've always got like an insight into the future of what's coming as well. Um, so I think today, um, you know, many of these technical best practices, including, you know, software development lifecycle and implementing DevOps processes are there. Um, the SDLC really provides um, guidelines on writing code, managing software assets and, de and developing technical standards. And DevOps automations like CICD, infrastructure as code and continuous testing basically enable the more reliable path to production. So I guess even though Agile is, you know, it's fairly old, I guess, in, in IT terms, it's still here, but it's evolved, right? So nowadays, you know, a lot of people are moving to the cloud. Um, when moving to the cloud, you need to build things in a more distributed manner. Um, because of the expectations of things going faster, there needs to be more security checking earlier on, so shifting left there. Um, there needs to be more monitoring and observability built into these products. There needs to be, because we're shipping features so fast, some customers even ship uncompleted stuff, but they toggle it with, with a feature flag, right? Um, we also want to test very quickly a hypothesis, right? So, you know, things like Canary um, deployments where you have a little bit of feature version next available to some users and the rest are on the stable release. So you can actually gain some telemetry and your de definition of done could be satisfied using that approach. Gives you more confidence whether you actually go or no go. Um, all of that stuff, <clears throat> and this is where I guess there's a lot of technology and, and tools around this. Um, that can really help you kind of really take Agile to the next level, right? Um, so I know I'm just a little bit over time. Um, that's all I had. Um, it's a bit of a dry topic, but I'm hoping that, um, you know, a dry Agile topic is still quite relevant and it's more relevant than ever, right? We understand why um, as part of this. Thanks so much, Arian. I don't think it's a dry topic at all. I really enjoy going over, like, I've done scrum, scrum mastery and stuff before, but it's really nice to go back to like the roots of like why we do it. And it's not about like setting yourself unrealistic expectations or things that just when things don't go right, it's just like, well, that's part of the process. So I think it's really nice to come back to that culture and that teamwork and that, um, what did you say, servantile leadership. I think that's a really important part of it. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, Jenna and I, you have any questions right now? Um, not right now. Okay. I'll yeah. hand over to Michelle um, and you can tell us all about your LinkedIn extravaganza expertise. <laughs> sure. There we go. Okay, well, I do not know about the rest of you, although I suspect because uh, Arian and Renee are both developers, they feel the same way as me. Um, but I am definitely a introvert. 
Uh, I really hate networking in big crowds. I hate going to places where there's a whole bunch of strangers and I'm supposed to walk around and introduce myself to them and, you know, give my elevator pitch and make an impression in, in the first few 20 seconds. And I just think, you know, it's so hard. There's so much pressure and it makes me really nervous and I don't like it. So uh, this is a picture of me a few years ago um, at a big event. So there was a big networking event, uh, a technology awards dinner, and there were about four or five hundred people there, all important people in the industry. And I knew I needed to walk around and introduce myself to people like what's the point in even going if you're not going to make some context and make some sort of impression. But I really dreaded it. So what I did to prep myself was I would turn up like at least half an hour early and kind of stand on the edge of the room just watching people come in trying to psych myself up for the approach and while I was standing there I thought what I'm going to do is I will look for someone that I know talking to someone that I do not know and then if I go over to the one that I know they'll introduce me to the other one and at least I won't be walking up to a complete stranger first time by myself so I had this excellent plan I saw someone I knew talking to another guy that I did not know and I went over to them and I said hi Pat and Pat said oh Michelle excellent do you know blah blah he is the CEO of the department of big important things <laughs> and I thought oh my goodness I have inadvertently walked up to the most important person in the room I need to I need to say something really impressive now what do I say what do I what are what are words what is even my name you know <laughs> And all of the thoughts were going out of my head. My palms were were sweating. I was feeling faint. I, um, I I didn't know whether I should just, you know, mumble an excuse and make a dash for the bathroom or I should just faint or what should I do? And while all of this was going on in my brain, uh, the guy leaned forward, took my hand and shook it. And he said, you're Michelle Sanford. I follow you on LinkedIn. I love your articles. It was such a relief to me because I thought, <clears throat> I don't need to prove anything to this guy. He already knows who I am. He already knows what I think. He already thinks that I have important or interesting things to say. We can just skip over all the embarrassing fumbling around and go straight to the part where we're just having a drink and telling each other jokes. <laughs> And it was at that point that I realised we have at our fingertips three tools that will allow us to, oh, I'll have it on the next slide, to establish credibility from a distance, to influence by volume and to access all areas from the boardroom to the factory floor. And we can use those skills to position ourselves for the career that we want. So I'm going to share my tip tips and tricks with you for those same things. If you are not already connected to me, this is a link to my socials. So you can uh, scan that with your phone or take a screenshot right now and um, connect to me because I would love that. Let's be friends and don't just follow me. There's no need for that. If you've been in Renee's program, then you should just uh, Click on the little three dots instead of the follow button and then it'll offer you an option to connect and say you are in this program. And I will accept you. <laughs> cool, let's get into it then. So this is a version of my LinkedIn. I have um, I have a different photo up there right now and I have a different banner up there right now because I think it's good to like keep it fresh. Um, but I'm going to talk about how you can, you know, brighten up and make your LinkedIn profile eye catching and interesting. Um, what we have here is um, 
the the top is uh, visual credibility. It is an opportunity for you to communicate without words who you are. People rarely spend a lot of time on other people's profiles. They're just flicking through the internet with very short attention spans these days. So anything you can do to catch their eye is a, is a good idea. I always say try and put something in that banner that communicates the essence of who you are without words. So I have a, a Windows laptop there, a Surface book two which has me on the screen with a bunch of other women I was interviewing for Ignite. There's a Microsoft mug that says uh, associates me with the credibility of Microsoft and behind my head there is a little robot that I built that I've been talking about at conferences around the world. So it establishes a lot of credibility and it says a lot about who I am just in that picture without anyone having to read any of my stuff. You can see there's a lot of colour in my profile as well also a lot more eye-catching than a black and white times new roman cv might be underneath my name um you can put your personal tagline now a lot of people just put their job title you don't need to do that especially if the job that you have now is um, not the job that you want to go back into. So, you know, if you are a mum wanting to return into the workplace, you don't have to put that you are a mum right now. Not that it's not something you should be proud of, you should be proud of that, but it's not the job you're looking for. So maybe you don't want to um, put that as the, the main thing under you. So, I had under there things like, you know, developer engagement lead. Well, actually is the job I have, but that's because I think it's the best job I've ever had. So I am excited about that. But I used to have things just like a technology evangelist, um, mentor, uh, director, storyteller, uh, chairman, stuff like that. Things that I am, but not all that I am. And also more things that I would like to be picked up for. Um, when I wasn't sure of all of those things or I didn't have quite so many strings to my bow, I used to just have a tagline under there. So I had uh, change the world or go home because um, that was a Microsoft tagline. And it was one of the reasons I joined the company, because that really spoke to my my essence, to who I was and what I wanted to be part of. Change the world or go home. Do something that matters. We are here on this planet in order to make a difference. So that was the, the line I had underneath there, uh, which pretty well sums me up. Um, be active, be known. So this is about making changes to your LinkedIn uh, daily or at least several times a week, but I'll go into that more later. Your profile uh, is your elevator pitch. You see there's only four lines that are visible there and you can click on see more and there is a lot more in my profile, which is very interesting, I think mostly to me. <laughs> but most people in the world only will read those top four lines. So there is no room for modesty and being humble in those top four lines. Those have to be the four most incredible brags that you have about yourself, the, the top things. And it's very difficult, I know, to big yourself up. So my trick for that is find your best friend and say, if you were introducing me by my three most glorious things to a business associate, what would you say about me? And you'll find that if your friend introduces you at those networking events, they will often think of four things off the top of their head that are amazing that you would be too embarrassed to say. Write those things down and put them in your profile. And in fact, practice saying those things to yourself in the mirror each morning, because it's very easy to say, I am a TEDx speaker, a tech girl superhero, a Microsofty and one of MCV's 30 most influential women in games, when you have said it a million times. So uh, once your brain can do it as a default without even listening to it, you're not embarrassed anymore because you're not even listening to it yourself. So those are all my tricks for getting around those things. Um, visual storytelling, yes, you can attach videos, you can attach photos, you can attach samples of your work. There's all sorts of stuff that you can put in there which demonstrates a little bit about who you are and what you can do. Uh, remember, when people are looking at your LinkedIn, 
really they are trying to figure out what would you be like as a teammate in their workplace what would you be like what could you do what and it's very very difficult to get that from a black and white times new roman cv that is the same pretty much as the 200 others in the pile they all have um job experience they all have qualifications um they're all pitching for the same job and so in order to make a difference and to stand out you really do have to try and showcase some of the things that are you what could you bring to the role and you need to make it easy for them to imagine you in that role and as part of that team and that's what we're gonna try and do throughout this so here's just some examples of of what i mean by the difference so if you look at the um Look at this first one, no photo. A lot of people will not connect to ghosts. If there's no photo, they will say, um, I don't even know that's a real profile. That could be a bot. Uh, no banner either, uh, nothing interesting here. There's nothing even filled in. By rights, this guy should not even be connected to me. Uh, the reason he is is because he met me at an event and we connected there and then, uh, but normally not. Uh, this this is nice in that he's got a banner establishing uh, visual credibility. So this is him saying he's speaking at that conference. Um, he's got a photo of himself that you can clearly see him and Anto as well there. The key thing there is don't be shy either. The purpose of the LinkedIn profile photo is if you're going for an interview or you're going to meet a potential employer for coffee in a coffee shop uh, or a mentor, they make it easy for them to recognize you to pick you out from the crowd so they don't have to embarrass themselves by walking around tapping a few people on the shoulder and saying hey are you arian or are you arian or are you arian um they can tell from your photo one of my colleagues for years had a photo of himself in his cycling helmet with his reflective cycling sunglasses and it made me so mad because you could not you would not be able to pick him out from any other cyclist from that photo this is not facebook this is linkedin this is your business network and the purpose of your business network is to connect to people who can help you in your career or who you can help in their careers because you know business karma <laughs> if you put good stuff out there the universe will repay you i believe um, he has done put his job title under his name the same as he has put it down in the experience section. I think that's a duplication and you don't need to do that. Um, you can if you don't have much idea or you really are that's the proudest you are so like with me that I love my job and I'm super proud of having that right now you you can do that but otherwise you know mix it up you add some extra things. Uh, Anto's one here I really like. She has, uh, that's the picture of the Microsoft campus in Redmond. That says, this is Antoinette Jago, and she is backed by the might of Microsoft. Now, people might not realise that is the Redmond campus. So she has overlaid a logo on there just so that they can be sure that that is what she is saying. And that's pretty cool. And she has a really nice tagline under there where she's talking about what she is trying to achieve um, for the education sector. Like these are all old profiles I've taken off now. But um, if you look at those people today, you will see different profiles, different photos, different taglines, just, you know, like people mixing it up and keeping it interesting. You want to attract people to your profile and with people's attention spans these days, that's more difficult. Now, show your work. So you have the opportunity to talk about your experience and under each section in your experience, you can attach um, rich media. So, you know, I, I have videos, I have photos of me at events or mentoring or doing stuff or um, articles you've written. And, you know, anyone can write articles these days. When I started out using LinkedIn, only influencers were allowed to write articles. Nowadays, you can write articles on LinkedIn and no one stops you and you can then attach those there showing, adding a little colour and adding a little expertise and revealing some of your thoughts, how you think, how you learn, how you share, how you do. And that's really what potential employers want to know. Who is this person and how will they fit into my team? So help them out as much as you can. 
see my IBM stuff is all uh, colourless and <laughs> and boring. Um, I'm not going to say that is a reflection of my days at IBM because actually I enjoyed it a lot. What is it? It is is a reflection of the times. We did not have mobile phones back then capable of taking photographs. We did not create videos and put them on the internet. I don't think YouTube was even a thing back then. So yes, in the olden days we were very restricted, but now you can do so much more to show show off who you are and what you can do. Take advantage of that. Uh, maybe you haven't been working. Um, don't leave out your volunteering stuff. So maybe as a mum, you might be like on a school board or you might have volunteered at school fairs or at the library or um, I don't know, <laughs> all sorts of activities at your church or uh, something like that. I think it's a bit controversial in Australia putting stuff on about your church because it, it's a very uh, agnostic country. However, I was a um, like I, I, I was a room leader in in the crash, I took care of people's babies and I did a really good job. It would be two hours we would have the babies for. And most people, when those babies got restless and started crying for their, their mums and dads, would just page the mum and dad to come out of the service and pick up the baby. Uh, I never did that. I would just look those babies in the eye and tell them that no matter how much they cried, I was not going to interrupt their parents in the two hours of peace they got per week. And those babies would just look at me. They would see the, the truth in my eyes and they would stop crying. So uh, I feel like uh, I provided a lot of rest for parents over those two hours. And I also got those babies used to being with other people and uh connecting with other babies in the crash. So it says I am calm under pressure. It says I help others. It says I'm a trusted advisor, uh, all of those things, you know, so it's not tech related, but nevertheless, it says many things about my personality and the skills that I have to offer. So don't think you can't put stuff on there if it was unpaid work. There is plenty of unpaid work that women do that is <laughs> giving you really job worthy skills think about them and list those things out that's all good that's all worth talking about uh continuous learning so yeah what you're doing now with renee's um series is continuous learning that you've done and you should absolutely call that out you should talk about it on your linkedin you could write posts about it you could say what we learned today what your three key takeaways are uh you could take a screenshot of this and um and talk about talk about that as well um you can also do a lot of micro credentials so i'm sure um you have been doing you know maybe Azure Fundamentals. I personally recommend AI Fundamentals. I think that is the easiest one to do. Reason why it's easiest is it's because it's the most interesting. Uh, AI Fundamentals, it's in the, well, AI is all over the news. It's all over all of your social media. Everyone is using AI. It's the next big thing. It's the next current thing. Uh, it's absolutely impossible to work in industry today if you are not utilizing AI in some way. Um, so yeah, get into it. Absolutely get into it. Um, and it's yeah it's wonderful i do have in fact i do have a um a learning path that i uh oh here we go yeah here we go here's a nice learning path i'm going to put that in the chat there which has got all of the open ai generative ai prompt engineering uh co-pilot stuff and a little bit on risk on uh, responsible AI principles, because I think those are all the key things that you you need to be uh, to be on top of things. And if you follow all of that learning path, even if you don't get it all 100 percent, you will have so many interesting things to talk about at interview. And in fact, before you get to interview, you should write in a LinkedIn post about what you have learned in each of those modules. Share that knowledge on LinkedIn, maybe share some screenshots or something or from within there. They do 
have some gifts and some pictures and you could you know put those in talk about what you've learned your top three takeaways link back to that learning path and uh it it will uh, establish credibility. It will link credibility and knowledge and expertise to your name. Need to go quicker. <laughs> I used to say ignore the skills section because that's pointless in that random strangers you do not know endorse you for skills that they cannot possibly know that you have. However, I know that these days both AI and human recruiters do um, word matching. So they will look at the job description um, and they will look for those skills in your LinkedIn profile. And if you match enough of them, they will invite you to the interviews. You can also do those blue tick ones. You can also do some online skills assessments. I think that's a little bit uh, because it's pretty easy to find those uh, questions and answers on the internet. <laughs> However, people do respect the blue tick, even though they have no reason to respect the blue tick. So um, yeah, get some of those blue ticks as well, especially for Microsoft or Azure related skills. Uh, so here's the example of what I mean by that. This is a, a job description for a Microsoft security engineer. This is the skills profile of Jess Dodson, who is a Microsoft customer engineer in security and cyber. Many of the things that are highlighted in the job description, she has listed as skills in her profile. So, you know, it, that's not rocket science. Do that to beat the system. <laughs> um, Recommendations, those are my absolute favourite thing. Um, these are references that you can get at the time you do something glorious. So it's often very hard to get references when you need them. But if you do a great job at something and someone says that was amazing, uh, you delivered something on budget, uh, eh under time and the team loved you is there anything I can do for you yes write me a recommendation I have over 60 of those on my profile if you read those from top to bottom you have a very clear view as to what it is like to work with me to work for me to be my boss to be my customer to be a partner of mine um or even to be my friend. So you can absolutely get a friend to put a character recommendation on there for you as long as they declare that they are your best friend or whatever they are to you. And it's um, referenceable in that you can click on the person and check what does their profile look like. So you can look for false profiles and you can look for things like that. So it's kind of like a blockchain of recommendations and references. Um, connect to people that are important to your career. So I will sometimes get connection requests from butchers, bakers and candlestick makers. I do not accept all of those because there is no reason to corrupt my feed with stuff around, you know, retail, uh, estate agency stuff. I don't know, housing. Um, I want technology industry things. But if someone sends me a message saying, hey, I used to be a postman, but I'm studying my Azure credentials now because I want to get into tech, I will absolutely accept them. Give me a reason to accept you and I will. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to add people that are going to try and sell me stuff and I disconnect from them if they do try and sell me stuff in the first message. Um, yeah, write something about what you know. Just do three things each day. This is my main tip. So read some you know you know read some of the stuff in your feed and like things that are things that you want to be associated with so as i say don't like stuff about um other careers like stuff about the technology industry um comment on things if you really want people to notice you and that will like get you in more people's feeds um and share stuff about things that are interesting so share about this program talk about what you've learned if you've got a photo with other people in it or just like a screenshot of this share that talk about it that will definitely um keep you in people's feeds make your name familiar so when they are looking at you for interview they recognize your name uh, wherever you go, talk about what you do, take a photo, what you've learnt. Uh, all sorts of things can be interesting. This is my most popular post of all time. Jason came in one morning. He's, um, oh, look, it's nine o'clock already. Do I need to stop, Renee? Um, I think if you know, Janani is happy to keep hanging out for a few more minutes, if you have, you know, if you have some more content. I can, yeah. I'm good. Right, okay, we can, we can keep going, then it's all good. Good, I'm going to get quick. 
Jason, I came into the office in the morning. It was dark. It was cold. You see, he's got this frowny look on his face and a baby in his arms. He was talking to a customer there and they were clearly giving him a hard time. I took that picture and I wrote this post about how pleased I was that at Microsoft, you can make your life work with your work however you need to. If you need to bring your baby into work, fine. If you need to work from home, uh, fine. If you need to take a day off, fine. Um, if you if you need to be in Singapore this week, fine. Like do whatever you need as long as you can, you know, still get your, your stuff done. Uh, Jace never liked this photo because he looks like he's having a hard time. And later in the day, he posted a picture of himself holding the baby under the Microsoft sign with the two of them smiling. But that post never got anywhere near as many views. The reason being, people do not want to see your Instagram perfect life. What they want to see is that sometimes you struggle just like they do, but that it's OK. Overall, it's OK. So, yes, they don't want to see your nervous breakdown on LinkedIn. That's for Facebook. But they they do want to see that you don't have a perfect life and but that you are making it work, that somehow amongst all of the trials, you are able to keep going and carry on. Give them a little hope in your story. Um, this is more attempts at me to overcome my shyness. Before I go to conferences, I take out a bunch of fit pictures of the speakers and I say I'm really looking forward to seeing these speakers at the conference. I tag them all in. After they see the post because they like it, I then send them a connection request saying I'm really looking forward to seeing you at that conference. Then before I even get to the conference, we're already friends. They look out for me at that conference and we're already getting a coffee before it starts. And I don't have to stand in the queue with the hundreds of other people waiting to talk to them afterwards. Life hacks. <laughs> Make friends in advance using these free tools. Let it do your work for you. Um, this one is quite a cool one I call social currency. One year we went to Sydney for our kickoff. Um, there were hundreds of people in this room and they had this glorious keynote speaker who was doing a great presentation. I knew as soon as that session finished, he would have a massive queue of Microsofties waiting to speak to him. And I had no chance of making an impression. So I took a nice picture of him with every eye in the room on him, him on the stage and also showing his lovely slide deck. I made that post while he was still on the stage and sent him the connection request. He accepted that connection request before he was even out of the queue of Microsofties. And he asked me for a recommendation. That's easy because I've just seen him speak and I can easily make that recommendation. So I made that recommendation and then he sent me a gift of these these lovely cards that he had been talking about in that presentation. He sent them to me in Perth, which meant he investigated from my LinkedIn profile that I was not in the Sydney office that I was uh, in from Perth. And he looked up the Perth office address and sent me these cards as a thank you. So I'll just skip back to that. I did something for him by taking this photo and posting about what a great keynote speaker he was. He asked me for something um, on top of that, which was the recommendation. So theoretically, I've done no way. I did something for him here by taking this picture. He thanked me by accepting my connection request. Then he asked me for another thing, but then he thanked me with this present but then he asked for another thing which was could you post about it but of course I had already posted about it because I understand how it works you do something for people people do something for you these are not big things these are small things that are easy for us to do for each other but in this way we rise together so uh, yes always be looking for putting some karma by back into the pool I have a bunch of articles on my LinkedIn um, I haven't written any for quite a while but they're all still pretty current um i recommend actually checking out my youtube channel which has a lot of me talking at conferences if you want more current content but all of this is still solid content 
Um, also, if you would like to see Renee speaking, uh, we have a webinar series that we're currently running um, around takeaways from Microsoft Build and Renee's is coming up soon. So if you um, register for that, you can actually, if you register for each of them, you can see the ones that we have already done because um, you will get the recordings for them as well. <laughs> Didn't know I tag you in the post. <laughs> I get so many tags every day, Michelle, <laughs> and 3,000 emails or something. So many <laughs> notifications on my phone, <laughs> but, oh, yeah. I'm, but I'm paying attention. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> well, I absolutely, my emails are out of control as well. But um, yes, don't forget, register for this. Share with your network about what a star Renee is. <laughs> Cool. I do have this program for students. I don't care that you are not registered at a university or a TAFE. You can still join this program if you want. Um, we have a monthly meeting that's just kind of core skills, career, mentoring, networking, you know, nothing technical uh, online, of course. And we do have ad hoc technical ones where I would get someone like Arian to say he wants to teach something. He would teach it. I just send out the invite to you all randomly for whenever that is he can teach it. If you can attend and watch live, excellent, because then you can ask him questions. If not, um, you would just uh, watch the recording on YouTube. So, uh, yeah, that's that. And that is, oh, register for the newsletter. There's, there's not a lot of free certification vouchers going around at the moment, but if you register for the newsletter, sometimes at the bottom of it, they have free training webinars and sometimes they have links to discounted or free vouchers. Or if you attend the webinar training, they will often give you a discounted voucher uh, or a free voucher in there. So it's worth registering for that newsletter as well. Cool, that's me done, I think. Amazing. Thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. I was paying attention. I've learned a lot of things. You know, I, I can take my, you know, uh, LinkedIn profile to the next level, I reckon, now and also pay attention to all the notifications I'm getting from Michelle specifically, I think is the, the important ones to pay attention to. So thank you so much, Michelle, for that. Uh, do we have any questions before I just sign off the show? I don't have any questions, but I really have to thank Michelle for the wonderful session today. It was highly informative. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you for being our, our biggest fan today. Yeah. Without you, it would have just been uh, Renee having to uh, flatter our egos. So we are so lucky that we have you with us. <laughs> Janani's also done like all of the cloud skills challenges that I've said as well. So she is the the biggest fan of the whole series. So I think you win the prize. Yeah. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Renee, for putting together all these sessions for us. And yeah, it was highly useful for me because I could do it all from my home, you know, uh, didn't have to travel anywhere uh, because that's the challenge for me right now with my baby at home. So, yeah, thank you so much, guys. And I'll definitely start working on my LinkedIn profile as well. I've noted down your points. So. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. I'm so glad that it's been useful for you and the other mums we've had along the way who it's it's hard for mums to join us, I think, because you never know what's going to happen when you're a mum. Uh, so, yeah, I'm glad we could have at least one person here today. Uh, I just want to say thank you again to Ariane and Michelle for this wonderful presentation. Uh, and look, I, I haven't got to see Michelle or Arian speak before, so this was a great one for me as well to see what you talk about um, and take away some of my own skills and feel good moments as well. Uh, I have put in the chat a link to the AI skills challenge that's going on right mm -hmm. now. So for the next month, mm -hmm. that'll be happening. And there is a Discord that you can ask questions on as well. So if you have something to get stuck on, that's a great way to get involved and have somebody help you out along the way because there'll be advocates like me on the discord around the world so there'll always be someone that'll be there soon to answer your questions uh so yeah i think that's all we have for this session and for the skilling sessions of this series i hope to catch you at the next catch up session in a couple of weeks time and that'll be our last mm -hmm. session uh so thank you everyone yeah. again yeah. thank you guys thanks to adia and too Okay. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.